Hello comrades and welcome back to Shanka Show. Stories about life in Soviet Union as well as modern Ukraine and Russia. Today's video is the answer to one of the questions. Hello comrade Sergei, how invasion of Ukraine has changed your opinion on Russia and Putin? Okay, so I'm planning to start with Vladimir Putin and we'll go from there. It's quite possible we might have to do a separate video on the topic of Russia. But before we talk about Putin, I need to remind you a couple things about myself. Is if you follow my channel, you probably know that I was born and raised in the Soviet Union in Kiev, Ukraine. Born in 1971, so I was so-called Soviet Ukrainian, or as some Russian people call me, Savkovy Chachol. Savkovy Chachol is quite an interesting term because Savok is a derogatory term for the Soviet Union because Savok actually means like a dustpan, so stuff to collect, dirt. And Chachol is a derogatory term for the Ukrainian. So I am Savkovy Chachol. <laughs> the main attribute of any Savkovy Chachol of Soviet Ukrainian is the person that doesn't speak Ukrainian, so I'm by nationality Ukrainian, my both parents are Ukrainians, not even like, you know, father Ukrainian, mother Russia, both of my parents uh, are Ukrainians, but I was raised uh, speaking Russian language and it's still my first language. I mentioned many times before that despite being a capital of Ukraine, Kiev was a Russian speaking city, public transportation announcements were in Russian, most schools were teaching in Russian language, like all the subjects except Ukrainian language. Signage was in Russian, uh, but we still had newspapers in Ukrainian and TV stations and radios. But otherwise, if you hear Ukrainian uh, speech on the streets of Kiev back in the day, that meant that uh, people that came from somewhere else, probably from Western Ukraine, because Kievlani, Kievans people uh, that lived in Kiev uh, spoke mostly Russian. So in some way Soviet Moscow was continuing policy of Tsar Moscow of a slow Russification of the other neighboring republics or areas like Ukraine and Belarus. It just was way milder uh, because for example Catherine the Great back in the day issued the law that was illegal to speak Ukrainian anywhere in Ukraine. And to this day I prefer the Russian version of my first name Sergei. In Ukrainian sound like Sergei. It just it just didn't sound right and still doesn't sound right. And when I had a chance to get um, my American ID, I changed it from Ukrainian spell and it used to be S E R G I Y and I changed it to S E R G E I because it's just uh, Sergei <laughs> it was just people will always say Sergi and that was really annoying. So I still have a Russian version of my first name and I'm having a hard time switching from Kiev to Kyiv, which is a Ukrainian way of pronouncing the name of the capital. So with all that Soviet era baggage or heritage, I never actually had any kind of like hate or despise towards Russia, even after the uh, Soviet Union uh, broke up back in 1991. And I still wanted Russia to become a successful state just like I wanted for Ukraine to become a successful state. And for a while uh, both new independent states Russia and Ukraine were following like uh, parallel paths. We elected former communist Kravchuk and Russians elected former communist Yeltsin. Russia started having uh, oligarchs, super rich people that uh, privatized for nothing uh, large Soviet era enterprises and factories and exactly the same thing happened in Ukraine. The only difference you could tell that Boris Yeltsin was slowly but surely degrading mentally and about physically like he started appearing drunk at many official events and I was really embarrassed for Russia to see the leader of the country being just drunk as a skunk staggering and doing other stupid crap uh, so that was like really embarrassing like you know you have this remnants of the mighty Soviet Union and he it's being led by this drunk guy and now I'm wondering maybe uh, you know we have this uh, term in Russian language it's called spaiit so it's like you help someone to become an alcoholic you constantly offering vodka and you know normal Russian will never say no to free vodka and that's how the 
people in, around Yeltsin kind of work him towards becoming an alcoholic. So when back in 1999 uh, Yeltsin uh, finally gave up and decided to quit, which is kind of amazing, and transferred power to uh, Vladimir Putin, I was quite um, happy about that event because yeah, uh, Boris Yeltsin was uh, definitely not in shape to be a leader of such a great country as Russia or any country for that matter. I also need to remind you that back in 1999 I already moved to the United States, uh, was in the process of legalizing, so I had a lot of my plate here in America, so I was not following the political events really closely. And I kind of moved away from this whole um, watching political events uh, for quite a long time. I was busy with uh, setting up my American life. If you read my book American Diaries 1995, I mentioned there that I fell in love with the American capitalist newspaper Wall Street Journal and I discovered that newspaper in quite unusual way. Uh, my farmer that I worked for here in Michigan uh, was, you know, normal American farmer, uh, saving money and everything. So instead of special packaging paper on the bottom of the wooden crates, uh, he used newspapers to protect peaches or plums. So we always had a big stack of newspapers in the market. And that's what I used to lie the bottom of the crates. And I noticed um, Wall Street Journal because there were quite sometimes these uh, articles catching my eye about Putin and mostly about, you know, Russia and Ukraine. So I started putting those uh, articles away. And then I started putting the whole newspaper away and reading through it. Because local newspaper, the Herald Palladium, there was never any international news, while Wall Street Journal provided plenty of news from all over the world. So that's kind of got interested in the Wall Street Journal beginning in 1995 and going into 99 and 2000 while I still work at the farm. So that's how I learned about uh, Putin going after Russian oligarchs, and that made me extremely happy because. By that time I realized one of the main reasons why uh, Russia and Ukraine in such a financial trouble is because you know the whole economy was uh, hijacked by a couple of guys and they were just milking the economy becoming uh, mega rich while the rest of people suffered so when I saw that Putin went after uh, Berezovsky Vladimir Berezovsky uh, Boris Berezovsky uh, one of the richest oligarchs in Russia who thought that owned the country and he forced him to sell all his assets including Aeroflot uh, Russian Airlines and run away to Britain. I was very happy and proud of Putin. Then he went after next guy Khodorkovsky once again the second richest uh, Russian oligarchs and then he put him in jail. I was super thrilled so I was very excited in the beginning when I saw that Putin kind of started uh, cleaning the house and going after oligarchs, which I saw as the main reason why Russia is not doing well, as well as Ukraine, but you know, we had our own uh, oligarchs and our own uh, president. So that was my initial impression of Vladimir Putin when I learned about him. I was like, yeah, it looks like Russia does need a strong hand, the former KGB guy who can get stuff straight and get economy going so, you know, people of Russia will benefit because Russia is such a rich country and maybe Ukraine eventually will follow um, this example and get rid of its own oligarchs that you know destroying the economy and destroying the country but then suddenly this hunt for the red oligarchs stopped and i could understand what's going on because putin was so successful and you know obviously he wasn't playing by the rules but like hey oligarchs don't play by the rules so i guess it's totally okay if the government doesn't play uh, by the rules because we know you know, they stole the money, they stole those factories, so you need to continue going after them and, and you know, seizing their assets and transferring them back to the government. But after Berezovsky, Hadarkovsky, maybe a couple other smaller guys, this whole, uh, as I said, hunt for red oligarchs stopped, and I couldn't understand why. And that's when I kind of got a little bit disappointed in Putin because like, okay, man, you were doing the right thing and why did you suddenly stop? Now, uh, since I'm older and hopefully a little bit smarter, I look back and I realize that there was no war against Russian oligarchs. It was just a couple of warning salvos. And after Berezovsky and Hadarkovsky were severely punished, the rest of the oligarchs 
uh, came to agreement with Putin and his government and probably set up some kind of system where government allows them to continue operating and continue the status quo. The only difference there's 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the profits were channeled into the offshores into the accounts of uh, Putin's representatives and stuff like that. So the system remained in place. It's just the government and like Putin himself started taking a cut. So that was my biggest disappointment with Putin back, I guess would be 2003, 2004, when I was like, come on, dude, there's more guys. I can name you personally. There's Tiripaska, there's this guy. They all stole money just like Berezovsky and Khodorkovsky. Why not going after them? And then I realized there's something is going on. And that's when I was, for the very first time, I was uh, quite disappointed in Putin. And then, of course, uh, the next uh, project that Putin started in Russia was uh, taking over mass media, putting it under complete control and shutting down uh, independent newspapers, taking over independent TV stations, killing journalists. So that process lasted for a long time. I guess the Kursk uh, submarine disaster in 1999 uh, taught Putin of importance of having mass media under total control because he really didn't look good in that situation with his famous smirk and the words, well, she just sunk. Uh, so if you could see what the huge change he uh, did in Russian mass media, because if you compare 1999 coverage of Kursk submarine uh, sinking and 2022 Moskva uh, ship sinking. There was a lot of noise back then, independent investigations. It was covered on every newspaper and TV station. And now it's just pretty much dead silence. The Russians, or Russian mass media, uh, as quiet as a church mouse, they admitted there's one person died uh, in that attack and that sinking. And it still uh, refuses to uh, accept that was Ukrainian um, or from Ukrainian side uh, missile that sunk the ship. So in 20 years, it's huge damage that he caused to independent mass media in Russia. Tell me, what happened with the submarine? I don't know. So it was quite obvious to me that uh, Russia is rolling back to almost this Soviet Union 2.0. You know, when the government controls everything, they just have a different, I don't say agenda, but, you know, used to be building socialism. Now it was just like building this uh, state capitalism. Uh, so, but it didn't bother me much because I was quite naive thinking that it should contain just inside of Russia. It would never affect neighboring countries like Ukraine. And then if you remember about the war in Chechnya, one of the republics of the Russian Federation, it was two wars. The first war was lost by Russia and then when Putin became a president, he started the second Chechen war and they managed to prevail. I'm not sure if you're aware, but in both wars, uh, Russian nationalist forces came to help Chechens. And I personally wasn't happy about it because like, why do you want to anger Russia? It wasn't like, sent, not Ukrainian government uh, sent people, but some Ukrainian uh, extreme nationalists uh, went to help Chechens to fight Russians. And I didn't support that because I don't want to anger Russia. But now from uh, looking back from 2022 after February 24th, uh, Maybe we should send more people because I now I believe that Putin would probably attack uh, Ukraine way earlier than 2022 or try to take over Crimea earlier than 2014, but he was too busy uh, restoring control over his own uh, federation. So the war in Chechnya kind of gave some extra uh, time for Ukraine, of course, you know, it didn't help much, but it postponed the inevitable. Then I lost all respect to Putin after I noticed how desperately he was clinging to power. So he was uh, president of Russia for two terms, and that's pretty much you up and you down, son. But then they had this uh, castle in what the uh, chess term with his vice president Medvedev. So Medvedev got elected as a president, 
and Putin became vice president for one term and then they did the castle again and Putin was re-elected again because in Russian constitution it states that you can't be uh, president uh, for more than two terms in a row so that allowed Putin to just kind of like uh, take a break and then become a president again that's when I was just like okay this guy is becoming just as bad as any general secretary of communist party of soviet union he wants to be a leader of russia forever and, and it's bad it's definitely soviet union is returning big time and then of course we can talk about this uh, growing and growing corruption in the soviet government you know all that old dudes bodies of putin surrounding him they all like fancy watches for five hundred thousand dollars they like young girlfriends like piskov the putin spokesperson divorced his wife and married uh, a figure skating who was like way younger than him putin was dating and having kids with the uh, bakayeva kabayeva i'm sorry uh, gymnast that his daughter's age way younger than him so this whole like this bunch of old Soviet era dudes that got access to unlimited amount of money. They build in uh, hundred million dollar yachts. They build in uh, nice castles. So this corruption was so enormous that I totally uh, lost any respect for Putin. And you know, it started moving to negative territory, but still it didn't affect uh, Ukraine that much at that time. And now we arrive into the events of 2013, 2014 in Ukraine. So as you see, there was a quite a uh, journey for me from 100 percent approval of putin back in 1999 and i went pretty much to negative maybe 10 or 20 percent negative uh, by 2013 just because what the putin did to russia and uh, to have a power forever so ukrainian uprising so-called maidan uh, back in 2013 2014 i was uh, in the beginning very skeptical because i didn't see the reason for you know such a huge mess that was going on in kiev and because the main reason was pretty much yanukovych who was you know puppet of putin uh, was kind of doing this game of chairs uh, he was playing with the west and playing with the russia trying to get the better deal i don't know if he cared about ukraine but definitely cared about himself so ukraine was in desperate um, need for another huge loan uh, so there was a choice between getting money from the West, but signing some agreement uh, about changing something in the economy, moving towards the being more connected to the Western economy. And in the last second, Yanukovych changed his mind. Uh, we will find out one of these days why. And he accepted Putin's terms. I think there was a question of $3 billion loan and Russia offered a better percentage and as long as you kind of be a friend with us so yanukovych went and that way and a lot of uh, young people in kiev and western ukraine got upset because they wanted integration with the west and and that's what, how this whole maidan mess started yanukovych ended up running away to russia and things went downhill from there so back in those days as i said i was quite skeptical and i was still strongly believed that it's better for ukraine to be on friendly terms with russia you know almost like taking advantage uh, of their you know desperate desire to keep ukraine in its own sphere of interest because uh, russia was willing to sell oil and natural gas way below uh, market prices world market prices to ukraine like they do it to belarus and you know well historically economic and, and economically ties uh, to russia were way stronger so i didn't see the reason to anger russia but at the same time i had no idea but that putin at that time already had a pretty good plan uh, for ukraine what he was going to do now we see it quite obviously this whole concept of russian world you know uh, living space for anyone who speaks russian so russia should be where anyone speaks russian uh, i didn't know all those things back then i said i didn't follow politics closely so even back in 2014 i was still kind of like hey we need to well we i was living in america ukraine needs to be careful and not to anger its big brother russia and then when russia next crimea in early 2014 i was uh, upset about it but i was like well this is what i uh, was kind of 
thinking that you don't want to get Russia upset and now as a result we lost Crimea because Putin is angry with Kyiv but of course I had no clue that it was all part of the plan and Crimea was just one uh, stepping stone for this long plan of restoring the Russian world, Ruski Mir. So that was pretty much my breaking point when I my opinion on Putin started just dropping like a rock. Uh, another reason is because he was just lying so obvious. I mean, every politician is lying, but Putin was like lying on TV that uh, there was no Russian troops in Crimea, that those were like a locals, armed local forces that decided to um, take Crimea from Ukraine and transfer it to Russia. And then about, you know, six months later, when he figured out everything is cool, he's like, oh yeah, those were our troops, they were our special forces. We're so cool, we're so, uh, you know, we're good organizing this operation of uh, taking Crimea back. And I was like, oh my goodness, this guy has no uh, standards. He has like nothing. Uh, he would lie one minute and lie more next minute. So that's when I totally lost respect to Putin. Это были российские солдаты или нет? Это были местные э, силы самообороны. За спиной сил самообороны Крыма, конечно, встали э, наши военнослужащие. Они действовали очень корректно, но, как я уже сказал, решительно и профессионально. Это, это факт, мы никогда его не скрывали. Наши вооруженные силы, but still, I was quite naive back in 2014, so I thought, okay, we have this new status quo, you know, Russia took over Crimea, all right, most population in Crimea was Russian-speaking, it looks like they were quite happy uh, for Russia taking over, like, sure, whatever, now we can, you know, remove this sore spot in relations between uh, Russia and Ukraine, because from day one after Soviet Union uh, dissolved, you know, Russians were, quite a few Russians were butthurt about that Crimea stayed with Ukraine because they always considered Crimea to be Russian territory. And, but as I, I was really naive and I didn't know about this grand plan of Putin. And just uh, soon after we started having uh, troubles in Donetsk and Lugansk region. Russians called it a uh, Ukrainian civil war. In reality, there was a so-called Russian hybrid war. It's when they send their troops, send their volunteers, send equipment. And at some point, uh, like Donetsk, um, People's Republic Army had more tanks than Germany. So Russia was, uh, you know, sneakily playing this hybrid war while uh, blaming everything on Ukrainians. So that's when, you know, I was like, okay, this is way worse than I thought. And... So my opinion on Putin uh, was pretty much uh, completely negative uh, after the events of in Donetsk and Lugansk, and especially after they were lying that it's a civil war and Russia has nothing to do with it, blah, blah, blah. And when you think that, you know, your opinion hit the rock bottom and there's no more uh, room to go down, MH17 Malaysian Airlines was shut down above uh, Ukraine above the territory occupied by Russia from the Russian book anti-aircraft missile and that started a new level of uh, low by Russian President Putin. You know, they started blaming Ukraine for shutting down that jetliner and there was a whole mess down there. And when I read the theory that, you know, Russians uh, was trying actually to shoot down the Russian uh, jetliner, um, Aeroflot flying uh, from Moscow somewhere down south and use that as excuse to start the war with Ukraine. I really kind of like, man, we know the Russians shut down the jetliner, but the whole concept of shooting a Russian, shooting Russian airliner down to start the war, I still even couldn't comprehend this whole concept that Russia would start the war against Ukraine. But now it totally makes sense. You know, uh, some time ago I came up with this expression. You know, in Russian language, uh, we use, instead of jackass, we call people kazol, so like a goat. So when you elect someone as a president, it's like you let a goat or a jackass uh, in your garden 
and you know he has access to your cabbage you know to your tax money but if you keep that jackass in the garden for too long he acts like it's his own garden now and that's i think what happened to putin and what happens to any dictator you know they treat the whole country as their own garden and its own cabbage and that's what kind of you know went from bad to worse to even more you know if we can say worse -er in case of putin so as you see my opinion on putin changed quite drastically in these last 22 some years from 100 percent approval in 1999 to being 100% disapproval by 2022 and then of course on February 24th 2022 we broke the new low and I realized he's not just a old dictator he is a crazy old dictator and this war and Putin's rhetoric opened my eyes I realized that while my opinion of Putin was steadily dropping in the course of the last 20 some years, Putin was slowly becoming a Hitler 2.0 and he turned Russia into a fascist state where government controls the whole economy, where government controls mass media, manipulates public opinion, creates this uh, warmongering, you know, it, it, there's so many parallels, it's even scary, even if you think about it. Hitler had Olympics in Berlin, then he annexed Austria. Putin had Olympics in Sochi, he annexed Crimea. Uh, Hitler was uh, solving a Jewish problem. Putin is solving a Ukrainian problem. It's crazy that Russian people don't see that, because they don't understand why ukrainians fighting so hard like we're bringing you russian world we're bringing you peace why are you fighting us so hard you are on the nazis and we came uh, to bring you prosperity and russian world and everything will be great but you are fighting us so hard it, it's insane but you know he turned russia into a fascist state so after winning against fascist nazi germany russia itself became a fascist state all right so here we arrive to the topic uh, about my opinion on russia but i think this video is long enough so we're gonna uh, make a part two where i talk about how my opinion changed in russia after invasion of ukraine all right thank you for watching another long and boring video from Oshanka show and we'll talk to you soon до свидания goodbye потому что если дороги будут то по ним неприятель проедет и прямо в сердце россии попадет я с ними согласен абсолютно.